Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Effectory broadcast in 2021, the new and exciting year. I don't know about you, but I think the next 12 months will not uh, only be more comfortable, maybe, but they cannot be any more turbulent, at least, than the last 12 months that we've gone through. And while everyone tells me that this is a lifetime of bad luck, I still wish you a very happy new year. And I'm really happy that you're back in our broadcast. You know us by now, and at least uh, I know we have a, a true audience that, that was with us through all these broadcasts before. But maybe if you're tuning into this for the first time, my name is Arjen Swank, and I'm one of the consultants at Effectory. At Effectory, we're the European market leader for employee feedback and employee listening solutions. And we help organizations understand their employees' experience, the true needs and the influence on the decisions that need to be made in the boardroom. On the one hand, of course, for the people pillar, but also for all these other decisions that involve your key, well, let's say key KPI, your, your, the, the people that matter most, which is your human capital. Of course, every month we try to invite inspiring guests to share with us their vision and experiences on the trending topics in the HR boardroom. Last year, we spoke extensively about, well, very interesting topics, including team performance, employee engagement, employee experience, uh, purpose in work, technological unemployment, company culture. And if we look at the uh, rates of people, we saw more and more people joining our audience over time. Not only HR professionals, but many also from the business environment around us. In the next 45 minutes, we're going to be talking about a human-centric culture. What does it mean to build a human-centric culture in your organization? If you want to join the conversation, you can use the community hashtag EffectoryHRLab, or you can just leave a comment in the box below, and we'll try to answer to your queries, your questions or ideas with our speaker, Mr. Martin Barner of Novartis Sandos, in the show itself, or we will get back to it at a later stage. Shortly about the human-centric culture, because what is that exactly? Originally, this construct comes from product and software development. It's where you put your user needs, desires, and abilities at the center of the development process. I quote, it means making design decisions based on how people can, need, and want to perform tasks rather than expecting users to adjust and accommodate their behaviors to the product. Well, for the audience in HR, I think this is a daily practice because human-centric is what we're all about. But for others in the business environment, it might sound like a dream, or like a nightmare, putting the best interests of your people first rather than having an emphasis on KPIs from a traditional business background, like your financial performance, your well-being, or your customer NPS. So is this all pride and glory? With our guest, Martin Barner, who is the head of people and organization global product development at the well-known pharmaceutical company of Novartis Sanders, I will dive deeper into his experiences of implementing and building a human-centric culture in the organization. He's a former engagement manager for McKinsey, worked in different HR roles, but also in commercial roles, and has some background in, um, well, actually, a, a more like a doctor. So he will bring in some neuroscience as well to this conversation. I shared the stage with him in November 2020 for the Virtual HR Congress. You might have seen him then as well. And I'm really happy to introduce him to our presentation today as well. Martin, welcome live from your home office in Basel. I hope all is going well. Thank you very much, Arjun. Yeah, absolutely. It, it is going well. I'm, I'm here with you, with, with the audience, uh, sharing something which is, is very dear uh, to my heart. And, and hopefully also we can bring some, some inspiration, how we can take this above and beyond, uh, obviously, Novartis um, and and expand uh, some of the thinking, some of the learnings, uh, some of the insights, and hopefully also for the audience to share back some of, of their learnings and insights, which of course is embedded into the Effectory webinar series as well. So great pleasure, great honor, Arjun, to once again uh, share the stage with you. Thank you very much. Super, thanks very much. I, I think I tried to introduce you on a very brief, let's say LinkedIn kind of way, your positions, everything that you've done in the past, mm -hmm. but. Maybe you have a much better view, of course, on, on who you are and, and what you would love to share. So can you maybe shortly just introduce yourself and maybe take into account, how do you look back at this turbulent year of 2020? Mm. How was it for you? 
And in, in many ways, as you rightly said, it, it was a turbulent year. Um, it's a year where um, actually staying, staying true to who you are, that's, that's as an individual, as a company has been incredibly important. It's been a year of reflection. Um, in many ways, I, I also believe it's been to some degree, and I will speak specifically to the, to the pandemic that, uh, that obviously hit us and, and has shaped our life, our ways of working. It's, it's, a kind reminder, if you will, uh, to us as, as, as people, it's an equalizer. Um, it's, it doesn't care where you live in the world. It doesn't care what your background, it doesn't care if you're rich or poor. It doesn't care about your, 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 your race. It doesn't care about your societal status, et cetera. It can hit anyone. And in that sense, I think that's a, a very humane reminder to, to all of us that well, maybe we should also treat each other with a bit more respect uh, as people and um, as mm -hmm. one another in society in general. And, and, and that's certainly been one of the reflections. Um, you speak to the turbulence. Um, I didn't share that with you yet, uh, Arjun. I shared it very broadly in, in actually across Novartis. I, uh, myself, um, with my family, we were impacted directly by COVID very early on, first week of lockdown. Um, and I shared out a blog post across the company in, in Novartis on the experiences, the reflections of that. And, and really that was to share the thoughts and all the uncertainties that in my case that, that came with. Now that's behind me. I'm, I'm glad to say I'm participating in clinical studies. I still have antibodies and I am as healthy as, as ever and um, no means from that. I also am deeply appreciative um, of that fact. Um, because that's not something to take for granted uh, as, as we go through uh, a pandemic, which will and is, um, is impacting uh, many of us either directly or, or indirectly into to how we have to adapt to it. So, so that's a little bit of a fast whirlwind um, on, the, on the pandemic situation. The other yeah. question you had, Arjun, on, on my background. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm an economist by, by education. Uh, that's how I got into to neuroscience, uh, the behavioral side of uh, and behavioral economics. Studied at um, at Caltech in in US, um, where I really it, it opened my mind, it blew my mind away how how we can think about economics in that sense, and 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 ultimately economics it boils down to sort of decision making. How do we make decisions as individuals and as as large groups, organizations, societies, etc. Right, macro and microeconomics, mm -hmm. and and that. I'm glad now that um, fast forward many years later, I, I've had stints in, in finance, I've been in sales and marketing, in strategy, and, and now for the last couple of years in, in HR or what we call people and organization in, in Novartis. So that's the sort of a little bit of that world when worked and have been educated three different continents, um, father with, uh, with two uh, flourishing kids and uh, also a, um, avid, uh, avid endurance athlete and as, as we also chatted a little bit before about um, on the background, um, I love cooking, um, and that's also one of my one of my passions. And that's that's the recipes that give me a reminder and and of good memories from different restaurants and uh, yeah, just in, inspiration in general. Cool! Wow. So, um, well, I think this is a, quite elaborate for our audience in terms of of who you are. I think this is a really great introduction. That will give some some idea. Who's the person behind just uh, the role? So, so that's that's good. Um, just before we start, uh, you have prepared a presentation about building that human-centric culture at Novartis. Maybe you can shortly share for everyone Novartis in in two main headlines and also how that how they uh, worked um, during the, the the years. Uh, let's say the, the the past year, which was impactful for any pharmaceutical company, I think, around the world. Um, I'm reminding just the audience that you can share your questions and your comments. So please do, please send any question during the presentation. We'll try to answer them either during or after. Um, yeah, and, and but maybe first, yeah, who, who is Novartis? What, what are we talking about? Yeah, so in, in very brief, Arjun, um, company of give and take 120,000 associates uh, spread across the world. We operate in more than 140 countries. We are one of the largest pharmaceutical uh, companies, if, if you look at it from a market cap uh, perspective. So it was listed on the stock market here in, in Switzerland and in, in US. Mm -hmm. um, it's also, um, as importantly, it's a company that, that touches pretty much all our lives um, in one way or the other. Um, we treat more than 600 million patients um, every, every year in Sandos, the division I'm part of alone. Um, as Novartis, almost a billion patients uh, get treated 
one way or the other with Novartis products. Um, mm -hmm. Novartis spans across innovative products, uh, what we call generics or products that have been off patent. Um, so it's a, it's a broad range of products that we have um, in a broad range of therapeutic areas and, and then really reimagining medicine in, in many ways and breaking grounds in many ways. Founded uh, back in 1886 um, here in Basel, Switzerland as a chemical dye company and then has evolved uh, ever since um, into now a pharmaceutical company and who knows uh, where, the, where that will bring us uh, when, when we expand and, and work more on, on the digital space using technology. So, so that's in brief uh, what Novartis is as a company. Super. Well, thanks so much for that. And yeah, I'm, I'm curious to hear about your story. So please do share and, and feel free to uh, yeah, take us along in that journey that Novartis has gone through. Absolutely. And, and the way I intend to do this is essentially in three parts. And as we, as we talk, uh, talk today about a human-centric culture, first of all, I want to take a little bit of a step back and a bit of a broader view on how strategy and culture are really intertwined. Um, I spoke to that a little bit about how I have a, a viewpoint of that, having worked across different functions. I came into Novartis as part of our corporate strategy team, since then joined our HR and, and, and P&O team. And, and what's my viewpoint on that and how have I seen that evolve over the years? I want to also pay a bit of, uh, of homage to my, my legacy in, in behavioral economics and share a bit of a neuroscience approach to explain why culture change really starts with individual change. Um, it's not organizational change where it starts. It starts, with, it starts with me, it starts with us as individual human beings. Uh, and then I would also be pleased to share a bit of a look behind the scenes at some of the concepts, some of the initiatives that we're working with in Novartis and really sort of how we deliberately and holistically embed, uh, embed that into our culture and, and how we really drive a truly human-centric culture. So those are the three elements. Uh, so just, just stay with me. As Arjun said, please feel free to, to come with questions. We'll take those as, uh, as we go along. If we look at it in recent years, um, we have as Novartis really been in, in, in media attention for the culture change that we are driving. Nothing embeds that and ex exemplifies that more than, um, than Vaz, uh, our CEO. Um, who got into the position, it's now um, three years ago, give and take. Um, yet that's actually not where the culture change started. Uh, it certainly is something that Bas embodies, uh, and it's something he's a, a great advocate, a spokesperson for, not just within Novartis, but how we want to drive organizational culture in general. What you also notice from a few of the clippings I, I take here, there's many different viewpoints on that, right? There's the AI-enabled viewpoint, on the top right-hand side, it's at the heart of performance, big belief, right? Culture does drive performance. This is not something we only do because it's the right thing to do. It is also a good way of driving performance, driving a thriving business. Uh, we have concepts like on boss. I'll touch more upon, upon that. And, and there's been a lot of curiosity uh, around on what does that really mean? Um, and as Stephen Baird, who is our head of, of p and in, in Novartis, um, right is I mean, culture is at the heart, culture is at the heart of what we do, how we want to reimagine medicine and rethink uh, work. So that's a bit of the background. Going even further back, Peter Drucker, um, management guru, if you will, um, famously said, culture eats strategy for breakfast. My own view is a little bit uh, nuanced on that in the sense, I think it's actually intertwined. Um, you have one with the other and, and, and not, uh, not separate. Rightly so, I do understand sort of where Peter Drucker is coming from in the sense of really highlighting that culture is an essential driver. So if strategy is really about what do we do, where do we play, then culture is really about how do we do that, right? How do we win in, in, in that space? Um, simple definition on the bottom right-hand side when we talk about organizational culture is how do we do things around here? What are the behaviors that we encourage, we tolerate, and what is it that we do not accept? Uh, so that's really what, what shapes our culture. Now, history within Novartis, my viewpoint to it, as I mentioned, um, been part of the corporate strategy team when I first joined Novartis six and a half years ago, got a unique look into how at Novartis, we over the years have transformed both the company, certainly as part of executing the strategy, and how the culture shaping has deliberately gone hand in hand with that. 
Thinking back to when I first joined, Novartis was a broader company. Uh, we did what was called um, portfolio transformation. We divested a couple of divisions. We doubled down on other assets elsewhere. We created a shared service center, um, which is called uh, Novartis Business Services, where we consolidated spend of more than four billion US dollars on an annual basis across different domains like IT procurement, also HR operations, real estate facility services, et cetera. So different domains that operate in shared service center. All of that was done at the same time. We also at that time refocused our values, behaviors, new HR strategy was introduced at that time by Stephen in his early days as, as a leader of HR. Later on, we announced a new company structure. We spun off Alcon as another division uh, a couple of years back now. We redefined our mission, our vision statements, our identity as a model. Uh, and then Bas came on board in, in January 2018. From day one, he talked about a culture with a focus on being inspired, curious, and unbossed. Uh, and those are things that have really permeated since then. What you also see is that that leads us to where we are now. Um, and it's a steadfast strategy in the sense that we want to be a leading medicines company with everything that entails. We have very clear where to play, so our focus areas and how to win, what are the priorities. Um, so that is, that is a clear point of view. I'll scratch the surfaces of that and, and do ask more questions if you want me to go, go deeper into that area. In this, on a human-centric culture, more interested in terms of how do we actually bring that to life and, and what does that mean? And why does it even matter? Why does it matter to be human-centric? So I'll provide two different viewpoints, one being more societal and, and the role that as a large company we play in shaping that as a society and one being more organizational. So as society, obviously the last year and, and even the last week um, are shaping things and unraveling things as a society. Uncertainty is, is high, is higher than many of us have experienced in our, in our lifetime. And, and that comes very close in terms of left-hand side to upper left picture from um, essentially police beatings uh, at the US Capitol. One of the, you will, the symbols in modern days of democracy, um, of um, our right to speak, um, things that, that showcase the fragility of things like, like democracy, like what we consider, but today as, a, as almost sort of an essential part of what it means to live in a Western world, and yet it's, it's fragile, um, it's under attack. Um, pandemic, no need to sort of speak much about how that's changing the way that we operate, the way that we work as companies. Interestingly, and there's a very good article I can, I can highly recommend um, by Re Rebecca, Rebecca Henderson from, from Howard, who pointed out that democracy is in, is, is in trouble. Businesses must help to fix it. Now, noticeably, that's not in the last week that she said that. Um, that was in 2020, in, in the middle, so in July of 2020, that she pointed that piece out. And that gives a lot of reflection as society. Why does it matter to be human-centric? As a company, it's pretty, pretty simple in, in, in our case. It's all about unleashing the power of our people, right? It's about driving ultimately the performance of the company to make it a sustainable business that we operate as a healthcare healthcare company and as a medicines company. What we also believe is there's so much more that we have the potential to do. Um, when we say reimagine medicine, we, we believe that that is the case. We can truly reimagine medicine. Um, you may have heard of some of the newer technologies uh, that are coming out, also of Novartis, where we do gene therapies, etc. Truly, it's, it's amazing what can be done by science today in that field. At a time when human genome was sequenced, when we thought we were sort of coming towards sort of the end of what could we actually do with medicines, it just showcases that with the aid of technology that speeds up every year, and um, we know about sort of Moore's, uh, Moore's law, which talks about the ability to process uh, data, it doubles every two years, uh, two every three years. Now that was set almost 50 years ago now. Um, and you can only sort of start adding up the mat. That's an exponential function. It's not a linear function. Technology is an exponential fun function. So that means by coupling that technology with the power that we have as people, we really can unleash uh, the power of our people. Now, the flip side to that, and now we get into the neuroscience uh, piece to it. 
There's lots of work, lots of it done by um, organizational psychologists, psychologists, sociologists, to some degree, economists as well. I'll reference a little bit of the work here by Charles Cooley, uh, but also some of the work that Keegan and Leahy are doing on, on an authorized mindset, a self-authoring mind, a, adult learning. And as Charles Coo Cooley points it, he has the concept of looking class self. So, so what's, the, what's the idea behind that? The idea being that there are stories we tell ourselves about ourselves. How do we project our self-image? And many individuals, me included, us included, there are periods in our life, and there are some that will do that more than others, will spend a lot of the time actually being more concerned about the self-image than about the work that actually is at hand. And that's part of unleashing the power of our people. If we cannot be ourselves, if we cannot be our authentic self to ourselves, but also in the environment in which we operate, innovation is hampered. There's no way that we can then unleash that power that we have. Now, what Cooley asks us simple questions like, how do I appear to others? What must others think of me? We rise how we think about ourselves. Um, and, and that's really sort of at, at the essence um, of that. And there's, there's a very specific reason sort of why that goes on. Um, the reason being we, we're humans, we have a brain. Um, and that influences us in, in many ways. It's a beautiful example um, by, uh, by Steve Peters, who read, wrote a book uh, called The Chimp Paradox, who describes three different parts of the brain in a, in a sort of simple uh, description. He describes the first one as being the chimp uh, part of the brain. That's the ancient part of the brain of the so-called limbic system. That is a part which is derived on ancient drivers and behaviors. And so think here about our recognition our need for recognition, our need to be safe, our need of belonging, our need for basic drivers like food, shelter, even sort of sexual relationship, if, if you can talk about that in that case. So really our ancient drivers. Um, and that's the limbic system, and he calls that the chimp brain. Then there is the more modern part of the brain, and, and that would be residing in the, in the frontal cortex, prefrontal cortex area. And that's the part which... Peters calls the professor part of the brain. It's a rational thinking. It's what distinguishes us from animals, uh, that we have a rational part of the brain. We can basically step a little bit outside of ourselves and we can reflect on things and we can put that thinking together. That's the, that's the professor part of the brain, the rational part of the brain. And then last but not least, um, he talks about the computer uh, part of the brain. That's everything which happens on automation. And you can, you can call that habits. Uh, those are the things that we, being unconscious of, most of the time will just do. Um, and think of this as, and it can be simple things like, now I can scratch my hair, I raise my arm. I don't consciously need to think about that before that action happens. When you enter a room, you, you press the switch to turn on the light. It's very automatic behaviors. That is roughly about 95% of all the things that we do every day when we put one foot in front of the other, that's an automated behavior. We don't consciously, most people at least don't consciously have to think about that. So those are the three parts of the brain um, in, in simple terms. Now, there's a few caveats to that. First of all, the chimp thinks quicker than the professor. So literally it's a chimp. Um, it jumps up and down, it's roughly about five times as quick in terms of getting new stimulus in as the professor part of the brain. It also has some very, very uh, say powerful allies in what we call neurotransmitters. And um, think of those, for example, as dopamine. Um, think of it as um, serotonin, oxytocin, et cetera, sort of um, adrenaline. There's a multitude of different neurotransmitters that the brain uses to send chemical signals to basically submissive us into action, certain actions that the chimp wants us to do. And, and that's how many things in the brain all, is organized. And that's why sometimes being rational uh, is, is actually a hard thing to do for, for, for human beings. Um, so that's a bit of the, the neuroscience uh, behind that um, and why we act in certain ways. And there it's important to, to go back to Cooley on the self-image part. Because self-awareness, as a, both as a leadership skill, but also as an organizational skill, is extremely important if you want to be human-centric. If you don't want the chimp to rule that behavior, 
Um, and if you don't want to spend most of your time as, as associates, as individuals of looking out for your self-image, but really doing good at what you do, then you need to pay a lot of attention to self-awareness. And that's an integral part of how we think about leadership capabilities also at, uh, at Novartis. Now, as an economist, there's also a very simple way of doing it. Uh, Kahneman, um, who's uh, depicted here in Tversky, um, Kahneman received the Nobel Prize in, in behavioral economics. He simply says there's a system one that's irrational. There's a system two, which is rational. That's sort of if you want the very, very simple version. And um, the point of that is it takes, if you want to change culture, it's a focused, it's a concerted effort. And more importantly, there is no organizational change, only individual change. There has to be a will for us individually, me personally, and there has to be a way in order for me to make changes. Now, holistically, that requires as a company, you think holistically, you have to think in systems and processes, rewards, interactions, and tools. We were talking earlier about behaviors, what do we tolerate, what we don't tolerate and boil that down to an individual change. It's not about what will the others do and how can and others do something for me. It's not me that has to change. No, we all have to change if we truly want cultural change. And that's that's underpinning, that's, that's the premise of it. Getting back to strategy and culture. And um, so I also want to, to leave the, with the fact that this one, that's, that's our official uh, priorities in, in Novartis, it's not our PO slash HR priorities. This is our overall priorities for Novartis because we truly believe that unleashing the power of our people, that is the one key, if you will, to unlock and drive other priorities. If we want to deliver transformative innovation, if we want to embrace operational excellence on a day to day, go big on data and digital, build a trust with society. First and foremost, we need to unleash the power of our people. We need to ensure everyone can bring their whole self and their, their true self to work every single day. And, and that's how, uh, how the other priorities will, will come about. So I will, I'll do a little pause here, um, Arjun, and just check. So before we, we, we move on to some of the concrete initiatives that we're working on, were there any questions um, that, are, that are coming in via the chat or anything that I should perhaps sort of elaborate a little bit more on or reflect a bit more on with us here today? Yeah, well, I, I think uh, you shared something interesting because we get a lot of reflections, actually, but also a lot of responses. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm biased in terms of the prioritization of what is most important first. Um, but what I like personally, and this is something that I think you can reflect on very well, uh, which is maybe also related to, let's say, the future of work is the on-boss principle that Voss applied mm -hmm. when he joined the company. It's such a unique concept, I think, that you decide, okay, we go on boss. So, and we get some questions about it as well. So I think for me, this is the first priority, but maybe explaining what does that mean? What does it entails? And then we will dive into it a bit further as well with the audience questions. Absolutely. And, and, and it's, a, it's a very, very interesting one. Um, it is one which at Novartis we, we took with pride um, and there's actually a book written about it and it literally is called On Boss. Um, it happens to be written by a gentleman called Lars Kolin and, and, and Jakob Bertner, um, who, are, who are Danes, right? I'm Danish myself by origin. I met Lars. Um, I have worked um, in, in uh, one of my prior jobs with his son. I've heard him talk multiple times, and he's a bit of an icon in Danish business society. Mm -hmm. And he wrote a book on Boss for a couple of reasons, of course. Now, switching to sort of that's where we took it from, right? Why did we pick on boss? Why didn't we pick something where with many would say mm, empower? That, that, that sounds like empowerment, where there's, there's a number of nuances to it. And more importantly, we wanted to, to have the debate of what does on boss mean? What does it mean to me versus what it means to you? What it means in a different context can be very different. And how we, we use that as a set of principles more than a set of very specific rules it is, is quite important to the concept of on boss um, and, and happy to discuss a little bit more as we, as we go in. And I'll definitely keep that and, and, and discuss that a bit more because uh, you're, you're absolutely right. That's, that is a, a crucial concept. And um, funnily enough, uh, it's also one where, and it was noted and also, and, and also I had it on the slide with the, with the media co context, um, Vaz is allowing us to wear jeans at work. 
right? Imagine that you can wear jeans at work. Now, mm-hmm. in most societies, that's that's fine. And for most people, that's that's fine, right? I can wear jeans at work. Now, sure. uh, that's always, not always the case in business sense, but the point is not sort of wearing jeans and wearing suit. The point is being yourself, right? Being your true authentic self and bringing that to work. And, and more importantly, as a leader, you're a servant leader to your team and uh, and your company. That takes many things with it, right? How do we... Um, how do we dr- do performance management, for example? How do we measure KPIs, which is one of the big, um, if you will, paradoxes or polarities uh, that comes with it? Um, and yes, we are very stringent in terms of having measurements in place, making sure that we 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 do drive performance, right? We do drive uh, associate engagement and many other aspects that we track that are linked to that. And then you can say, well, is that really sort of unbossed in order to drive that and, and look at data on that? And and that's a good discussion to have, right? Um, so that's a little bit on unbossed. Thanks, Arjun. Nice. Thanks so much. Well, I think you you just made the bridge to the second question that I think is important. Is uh, So maybe this comes from a traditional culture and you guys do it in a whole different way now that you've uh, applied these principles. But the question that Anna was asking us is, okay, but how do you measure then how you're doing, how you're performing? So what, what are your... KPIs, let's say, you just mentioned associate engagement, which I believe is one of the measures that you can use to show yeah. uh, engagement of people into the organization, into their jobs. Um, yeah. But but you're trying to build this human-centric culture. People are autonomous to take their decisions. What what kind of things do you measure then to see if you're on track? Yeah, so we, we do do it on, on many different levels. Um, and I would also be, and I would encourage anyone, I mean, reach out, connect with me here on, on LinkedIn. We can continue that dialogue. We can continue also a more specific deep dive into that. In in a few sentences, um, we have quarterly engagement surveys uh, mm-hmm. that, we, that we do. We have now done it for almost two years, um, where we increase that to a quarterly level for all 120,000 associates. Um, it's a set of questions. Initially, it was 10 questions. Now we broadened that a little bit. Um, so we, are, we had more than 10 questions um, that test different aspects of culture, um, engagement being one of them. Um, mm. And there are other mm. things like um, speak my mind, uh, for example, which we believe is a very important part, right? Can, can, you, can you truly sort of speak your mind? Can you speak up without any fear of either retaliation or, or not being listened to, et cetera? Um, so a very broad set of, of, of questions that we track on a, on a quarterly basis. Interestingly, also, we make that available for everyone to have a look into, right? So I could see what it is in, in different parts of the organization. The only, the only way we blind it is it has to be it, I mean, at least five individuals in a team has to fill out before there is results scored for that team. Uh, yeah. So that, that's the anonymous part to it. That's one part. We also do uh, what we call team perspectives and leadership perspectives, which mm-hmm. are different types of feedback done at the same intervals now, and we sync that up. Uh, and then we combine it with a lot of other data. So um, one thing that's that's very big in our hearts is, for example, diversity and inclusion. So how do we measure and track diversity and inclusion? Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's something that goes much broader than, if you take diversity, simply sort of gender diversity, for example, which is a very traditional one. Uh, and one we do, of course, measure, but there are also other parts. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. It goes into, and I, I can explain more about that, our uh, so-called EPIC pledge. Um, so EPIC being a pledge as part of the UN, where you have um, pay transparency, where you ensure that you pay for the job being done. Um, and I can also explain more about that. Um, and that, so that's that's another aspect of that, and we track that, right? How many have access to that? Um, how do we track on different benefit system, et cetera? So it's really a holistic and a broad view um, yeah. that's that's being tracked on that. Um, all of that is brought together in what we call, uh, and we we named it Culture Sense, um, yeah. which is where we bring both internal and external metrics and and data together in a holistic way, uh, where we can track a various uh, variety of different aspects to it. So I hope mm-hmm. that gives a little bit of a nuance to the variety. And yes, we absolutely believe in tracking it. We believe that that's, that's a proof point that especially initially was very important to convince the doubters. Um, and of course, there were doubters internally and, and there should be. Um, and also um, convince our shareholders that that's, that is a good thing to invest into, right? A company which has a, a human-centric way of implementing culture. And and it, looking at these uh, doubters, I mean, mm-hmm. my assumption is that your manager is saying, "Okay, wait a minute, we go on boss now," <laughs> but 
But what is then my role as a manager? And you said servant leadership. I think that's a really nice way of, of well, sometimes telling people to rather become a coach than becoming a directive uh, uh, leader. But just in a very short, uh, short, short summary, how, how do people respond to that? Like, do they just give up their jobs from the one day to the other? Hey, we have a new CEO and I'll go do something else. Or how does that look like? It, it, it differs, right? I mean, that's, that's the short and not very fulfilling answer, Arjun. <laughs> it's one where, um, and, and bear in mind, um, Novartis is still very and has been for many years and decades a very performance-oriented company. Mm-hmm. Uh, I remember a leadership meeting we had. Vas got a question on why is performance no longer a value? Right? Very sort of simple question. Why is yeah. it not curious inspired on boss? And the, the answer he gave, and I'm, I'm pretty confident he would still say the same today, performance is such an integral part of the DNA of what it means to work at and be with Novartis. It will mm-hmm. not go away. Um, and he literally used sort of the words that despite if, if I did not speak of performance in my time as CEO, it will probably outlive me as a CEO. Right? It, it's that ingrained into the DNA of, of mm-hmm. the culture. Uh, so that's not that's not the worry. Um, and, and more importantly, we're now looking at what drives performance, right? What drives it in terms of culture? And, and we talk about curious, inspired, and unbossed and, and being self-aware and having integrity, et cetera. Now, those are sort of the drivers underneath. Um, that doesn't mean that we don't review business numbers and doesn't mean that we don't have a business forecast and, and financial yeah. forecast, et cetera. Right? Um, right. And we also track that and, and make sure that there's good business behind it um, because that's that's the way to make it sustainable ultimately. Yeah. yeah. Well, thanks thanks very much for, for sharing that. There's many comments coming in, so I'm, I'm more than happy to summarize that as well. I think you brought a few examples of illustrating how this works for Novartis. So while also keeping track of the time, I think uh-huh. it's really worthwhile to share some of that as well um, in the next 10 minutes, let's say. Absolutely. Okay, then then I will I'll move us on to a couple of those specific examples. And again, I'd be more than happy to share more, uh, more offline or through the questions and then leave sufficient time for the questions. Super. And so company culture, I, I, I shared about Curious Inspired on Boss. Um, we do believe that that's increasingly important the more complex the business environment is. Um, and that people can do their best to be curious, inspired, and unbossed. What I listed here is, is what that means. What are the premises underneath that? Um, and I, I won't go, go um, further into it. Uh, we are also wanting, and I shared uh, a bit around how we want to create a diverse and equitable and inclusive environment. And uh, one of the things we've done um, is uh, join the, the Equal Pay uh, International Coalition, or so-called EPIC uh, pledge, uh, already back in, in 2018. Uh, and that goes into having consistency in pay equity uh, globally as, as a global company, making sure that we pay for the work. And it doesn't matter if what someone came in with in, in terms of their salary. It matters what is the job that they're doing and what's the value of, of, of that job. Remove biases from the systems. Uh, so nowadays in many country, most countries now, and it's going to be rolled out to all countries, a contract and the salaries are going to be automated to a much, much larger degree. So that means it's not me as a manager who sits with my HR business partner, and then we sort of, we figure out, okay, what's what's the right salary here? And then we agree on a number and we have a, an interview process and maybe there's sort of like a hackle process. No, it's it's a it's a process which takes out biases. And, and it's also being aware, again, back to sort of the brain science behind it, that as human beings, we have unconscious biases, right? At that, like it or not, um, we will treat people differently because of those unconscious biases and some of those we want to remove as part of that. We want to ensure gender balance in, in management, hugely important. Um, it's talking of things that we track, that's being tracked at every single level of the organization and something we want to make sure uh, sure really happens. Um, consistency in the employer experience uh, throughout, and we call it moments that matter. So that goes from the first impression from the day that I joined the company or that I hear of the company to the lasting impressions of, if I'm not an associate, what's my, what's my thinking around Novartis? And if I am an associate or if I'm a, a, a former associate of Novartis, what are the impressions I still have? And specifically, we go into a few areas around my impact, my growth, and my leadership. And that's really where inspired careers and on boss come to life. And, and that's what I will, I'll give a few examples on. 
first of all, inspire, connect that to our purpose. And, and, and many individuals will say, and yes, I will agree with that. It's a very noble purpose uh, to treat almost a billion patients every single year as, as, we, as we touch those lives across Novartis. That means if you include the patients, the, the, the loved ones, the relatives, the connections that those patients have, it, it touches lives in, in almost any part of the world. And as I mentioned, 140 countries represented. So yes, that's a noble purpose. Some of the things we're also doing there specifically, um, Energize for Life, and I'll give a little example in a moment. Um, that's, that's saying we need to thrive as human beings, not just at work, but as human beings. And what are the premises for doing that? And um, what are the foundational behaviors like good recovery, very important, good sleep, having movement, how do you build that in, having the right mindset, mindfulness, and good nutritional habits? Parental leave policy, we broke ground uh, there as Novartis, and I'll also talk a bit more about that. Performance management, something that we're, we're now rolling out. Um, we've gone away from, from ratings uh, as, of, uh, as of this year. As an example, we have other ways to remunerate uh, our individuals. We introduced a, a platform of global recognition. Any associate can recognize any other associate across the company on an ongoing basis. Um, and uh, yes, that's sort of its so-called spark points. Um, but you can turn those into uh, to monetary things or you can donate uh, that as well to, to charity. So it's, it's a broad range of what you can use those spark points to. Secondly, we believe in going big on learning, having a sense and a level of curiosity. Um, and there we offer many different platforms of learning. Um, and many will be familiar to, to, to many. Uh, so like Coursera, like Lin LinkedIn Learning, where you have a broad platform um, that can be made available to any company that, that signs up. Not only do we do that, uh, but we also offer that to our loved ones. Um, so we get an opportunity, which especially in a time of a pandemic, which I found crucially important, that I could gift licenses to Coursera, to, Link to, to LinkedIn Learning, um, I could gift, uh, and we use for Energize for Life, we use an app called Technomex. I could gift those accesses to individuals outside. They could be family members. They could be, uh, be good friends. Um, and that gives a, a shared sense of also giving as an associate, involving others into that learning. Flexible work uh, is another important one, um, which didn't start with, with the pandemic, but certainly got fast forwarded uh, as, as we entered uh, into to that situation, lockdown in many countries, et cetera. What we put in place there is a set of guiding principles, again, deliberately not specific policies, guiding principles on what do we mean by flexible work? Uh, and I'll also talk a little bit more about that. Last but not least, a lot of... Uh Questions. I'm sorry to interrupt you here, but <laughs> there's many comments coming in. One of them, and I think this is linked. So there's many comments coming in on the on-bus principle, to be to be yeah. fair, and also about the role that leadership plays in this. And I know yeah. also because we're we're bound on time that you have yes. a bit of an extensive overview of that on-bus leadership principle, which I yeah. feel is very valuable to share, mm -hmm. which I think is a bit further in your deck, to be honest. Let <laughs> so me, maybe yeah, let, me, let me get to it, Arjun. Okay, good. If you jump to that one, um, then, then that will be great, I think. It's, uh... So, uh, so Unboxed. Um, it, Sorry it's... to interrupt, but I think this is valuable for the people that uh, jumped in with these questions. Exactly. Absolutely. This. Yes, absolutely. And, and thanks for, for pointing me in that direction, Arjun. It's, sure. of course, important that, uh, that, that we serve the audience also in this case. Uh, and, and, and very happy that, uh, comment on this. that there, really, uh, there is that level of curiosity. So Unboxed. The basic premise behind it is what do we ultimately believe as humans that lead to better performance? And um, good work being done, uh, and I can really highlight the work of Dan Pink um, that we also work with in, in Novartis. He boils it down to three factors, autonomy over the work that you do, mastery and, and purpose. And yes, that's different from the work, the very manual work that was done in the industrial age. We are now in a different age where it's not about doing mechanistic work. Um, we essentially have technology, we have robots, et cetera, to do that. Um, so that's that's in, in, in the essence on the premise on the need that of personal performance and uh, satisfaction. Now on boss, and here comes uh, sort of the book. What does it mean, right? You have the boss and you have the on boss. Um, so the boss is someone who is the supreme commander, who controls, who directs, 
who is exclusive, who's the talker. Um, and it goes into how you treat customers as buyers, etc. You keep information secret, right? It's, it's the exclusive few. Now, a, a great example um, is what uh, Bridgewater does, um, where they believe in, in so-called radical transparency. Right? They film all their meetings, including their um, executive meetings, and they make it available to all associates. Fantastic way of unbossing the organization, right? And, and putting a level of accountability to everyone to step in and be inclusive in terms of how decisions are being made, what is taken. You can speak up um, beyond boss. It's about being a partner. I mentioned servant leadership. It's not specific. I mentioned here, but it's a, it's a clear way of it. You, you inspire, you focus, you encourage, you acknowledge, you share information, you work collaboratively. It doesn't mean that you don't set high standards. It doesn't mean that you don't hold people accountable, yet you do it on a, if you will, sort of a moral high ground, right? And, and you always listen, you make sure you're inclusive and bringing that perspective. Um, and that's really the, the leadership journey right, that, that we are on. Now, an important piece to that, um, that, and you can say, so that's great, um, but how do you do that? Um, we believe through what we call the unbossed leadership experience. Uh, and that's a way to really Im embed ourselves into that. And it's not something that, that comes from one day to the other. It's, it's a journey. Um, we started initially out with doing this for our top leaders across Novartis. We did a one-year journey with various full-week immersions. In, in different contexts to bring the leaders out of their, their normal, say, if, if you will, sort of safe environment and, and, and really to start to peel the, the layers of who they are as, as individuals. Very important, and I'll, I'll go back to also some of the work from, from Keegan and Leahy on what's the story that you tell yourself about yourself and, and how does that impact you? What, and what's the story about you tell you how you show up as a leader, what you do as a leader? And again, it boils into curious, inspired, and non-boss culture, especially the self-awareness. There are many different elements that go into it, 360 feedback, different practices, um, growth understanding. And here I'm talking about uh, growth from, a, from a, a, a human perspective. You do what is called an immunity map, which I'll showcase in a second. And you focus really then on, on one big thing that you can change that will make a big impact um, for yourself, for your environment and, and people around you, whether it, it's your personal life, private life or, or at work. What the immunity to change is, 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 is going through a structured approach uh, that, yes, it requires some coaching. It requires a lot of feedback. You do it also with your team. You shape it with your team. You get feedback on your behaviors. And it's an extremely vulnerable moment for many leaders uh, that are not used to it. It's also one that requires a lot of going back and reflection. And, and yes, many things happen in childhood uh, that will shape our, our lives in, in years to come and who we, who we are as human beings. And we do believe that that, that self-awareness is, is an extremely critical piece to unlocking that individual change that will then lead to organizational change. And um, you go in under the big assumptions that, that, that come with that. Um, and that's something where it takes a lot of courage, of course, from leaders. Vas himself has, has shared that out um, with, with leaders in our companies, associates in our companies. And it's something that is, it's a good thing to share that out. It's, it's a good thing to start to make us all more, more human, right? to make us all, all more relatable and show also the kinks and some of the backsides to the, to the coin uh, that we all have and, and just be open and honest uh, and transparent about that. Um, so that's, that's a bit of the, um, the unbossed uh, principle and, and journey. And what it ultimately boils down to is self-awareness, having psychological safety, and being eternal developmental, right? having a developmental and a, and a learning uh, culture, uh, which is really part of that. So I hope uh, that that gives a little uh, some reflections on, on that, Arjun. And, and I don't know whether there are more questions related to, to Unboss. Well, I think you've answered the majority, Martin. So thank you very mm -hmm. much. I think this was really useful and helpful to also make this practical, to really show from the from the top line level of what does it mean for Unboss to actually get to the deep life for yeah, the majority of our senior senior audience that says, okay, but what does it mean to me then? Or how does this impact my daily practice as a leader, mm -hmm. as a, a team lead, or, or whether I'm a C-level uh, um, manager of, of a company? 
So I think it was really helpful to understand, okay, how did you guys then put this into practice for you, for an organization with well, 120,000 people? It's, it's such a big change. It's, it's a bit of a leap of faith, I would say, as well. Um, so I think, uh, yeah, well received and, and well commented. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's bound by time, actually, our broadcast. So I have to, well leave you with a final question um, uh, which I really find interesting as well, which is about you, you describe those moments that matter. And the mm -hmm. question of Bill is, so what actually defines moments that matter? And maybe you can just inspire us for what are those moments for you and then we'll close it off and uh, yeah, then uh, we'll get to the end of your presentation, unfortunately. Yes, and it's uh, and moments that matter is essentially looking at the employee life cycle. Right? So it is from your first contact, in, in our case, with a company, uh, and then to to the last contact with mm -hmm. with that company and everything in between. Right? And there will be different moments that matter to different individuals, and also it it, it will change over time. Right? Mm -hmm. So let's take a in an almost sort of full circle to, to where we started some reflections on, on the year past, um, what has mattered in, in, in a turbulent year um, mm -hmm. is for, for many will have been a sense of flexibility from the company. Right? And um, one of the things I'm very proud of in, in, in the principles we put in, as we call choice with responsibility, it's, it's our version, if you will, of distributed working. So the, the notion that you can work anytime, anywhere, Mm -hmm. Now, yes, are there some uh, governmental um, rules and regulations you have to stay within in terms of taxation uh, regulations, uh, social security regulations, etc.? Yes, there are, right? So it's not unbound in, in that sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yet a lot in companies are shamed by, by policies that companies put in place. And, and a principle we put in place is that any associate anywhere in the world can have the flexibility, if their job allows, of course, to work from home without having explicit permission, if you will, from your mm -hmm. manager, right? Mm -hmm. So you don't have to get permission from your manager, okay, today I work from home. Now, yeah. of course, you could say, well, in pandemic, uh, da, that, that's that's so natural. Um, everyone you, uh, right now. Huh? <laughs> everyone works from home and you're, you're forced to it in, in, in many or, or most countries. Now, that's not something that's pandemic related, right? That policy is here to remain. Um, and it's here that once individuals will be allowed back into workplaces, that will persist. Mm -hmm. Now, you can also say, well, that that's sounds a little bit utopia and there are probably areas you won't be able to do it in. And, and yes, there will be, right? A manufacturing line, as long as that needs to be operated on site um, until we have the technological advances that you can do it remotely. Yes, of course, then a manufacturing line, for example, yes, you need to operate that in person, right? And you also do that, by the way, during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really sort of what, what your work allows for. Um, so that, that's, that's something which, let's say, a moment that matters that ties very much sort of into, into the pandemic. Um, other things that we look at from, and, and now I talk sort of from a, from a data perspective, and, and what I see in the unit that I'm responsible for is, is learning, for example. Um, interesting fact is that if you look and, and, and you correlate learning to uh, to retention, what does that mean over the span of uh, for, for different associates and different individuals? And we look at it many different ways. But one I would point out is for the male part of our population, for example, that's a relatively flat curve. So the the, the learning hours that they spend and and what we can track across all our data and systems is a relatively even correlation. Whereas for our female population, it's it's a it's a very steep curve, meaning that if you don't spend a lot of time learning, in our case as, as female associates, there's a much much higher likelihood um, of um, of not being part of the company. Um, to the point, if that's lower than um, and in the unit I have, we have a voluntary turnover of roughly four uh, percent. So by all means, relatively low. Now that increases to about 50, 60 percent if you're below 20 hours. That's massive. Absolutely massive, um, and it then decreases well below uh, the four percent if uh, you were say above 80, 80 hours, a hundred hours of, of learning per year. Um, so it's very different. What what are moments that matters uh, to individuals, and and how can we provide that? And using data in the background and and and, and data scientists to really model that and, and figure out what a stake costs, leave costs, etc. That also gives as as P and O and as an organization 
good ideas into what are the types of interventions we need to dial up and, and, and which are not as important for, for associates and moments that matter. And how does that change in different, different countries, different cultures, different settings, um, different age brackets, et cetera. Um, and, and to me, that's, that's a true sort of fascinating way of, of, of using that. Personally, um, if you ask me, something that, that really matters is absolutely having autonomy, being able to also do things as, as we do today, right? Mm -hmm. Share some of my, my innate beliefs and do that with other, other companies and other individuals and, and, and give that out because that's, that's our, our duty, I would say, as, um, to form a better society, to really see how can we, how can we really in better all the things that we treasure about the, the, the world we live in, about the progress that, that, that we see and having the opportunity and call that my work. Sometimes, yes, I have to pinch myself and say, well, that's, that's fantastic. I actually get paid to do this by the company I work for. Um, which is which is amazing, and and that's also part of it, right? And that's that's a personal, if you will, sort of moment that matter. Mm -hmm. um, so. Well, thank you very much. This was very clear. I think it's good that we uh, well we see this beyond only being a company values, just the words or just the way that that they described on paper, but the actual mm -hmm. implementation on site or or as you're doing it. I think this is the most important example of how this is done and why it's so so important to. Well, maybe even transition. I think many organizations understand the value of their human capital, but not all mm -hmm. of them put them on the prior first priority. And I think this is a great example of what you've done in Novartis to mm -hmm. make this happen. So I'm really happy that you that you shared this inspiring story with with me, with us, with the audience. Uh, so thank you very much for that. If there's any questions from the audience, we will for sure try to uh, connect you guys. But I think it's good that everybody looks you up on LinkedIn connects and and I think with your invitation to share a direct message please if we didn't answer your question already do reach out Martin is more than happy uh, to help you with this yeah and, and real pleasure Arjun and and for anyone out there who wants to shape this at a, at a company level or societal level and um, do it holistically have patience uh, look at it broadly and and don't forget it starts with individual change and and really pay homage to that because that's that's who we are as human beings uh, so that would be my my parting words for today and, and big, big thanks for the opportunity to, to share, share our learnings, our thoughts, insights, and, uh, and most of all connect. Uh, so big thanks, Arjun. Sure. Well, th thank you very much. So to, to everyone in the audience, thank you for joining our first broadcast for 2021. Uh, well, there's, there's a lot of interesting sessions to follow still. So uh, yeah, I, I really invite you to join us. Uh, the next stage will be, will be actually be, on the 11th of February for Thomas Liebach of Lego Group. So he will share the modernization journey that Lego has gone through in their people domain. So this included closely listening to their audience, their, their co-workers, the employees at Lego to understand what is the essential part that they need for us to modernize as an organization. And now more than ever, what we see in our daily practice, it's important to have a close strategy on your employee listening. How often do you tune in? What kind of comments do you reflect on? How do you bring the intelligence to action on the floor? And we're more than happy to share you more about that from a factory side. So if you want to learn more about that, go to effectory.com. But also we will keep inspiring you on the latest HR trending topics in our webinars and our podcast series. So tune in next month again. In the meantime, chat with us using the hashtag EffectoryHRLab. And if you're looking for more information about Effectory, go to effectory.com. And finally, if you have an interesting idea to share with our audience, don't be afraid, reach out, send me a direct message, and I'm more than happy to discuss how we can make this happen. Good. Thank you again, Martin. Thank you to the audience, and I'm happy to see you next month.